Good morning, Dr. Koss. We're sitting here 14 stories above Manhattan in your beautiful apartment. We're surrounded by Asian, African, Eskimo artifacts, as well as some incredible artwork on the walls. We are here because of the American Society of Cytology State of the Art Symposium. I would like you to be the expert of this panel State of the Art for the American Society of Cytopathology. When I was asked to do that by the meeting organizers, I could think of nobody better than you to tell us how cytopathology, and especially cytopathology of the urinary tract, has come the distance that it has and how far along it needs to proceed for the future. Before we go into the particulars of that specialty, Leo, could you tell us how old you are? And first of all, let me thank you for coming. I'm happy to have guests. These days I'm not as mobile as I used to be, which is the reason why I cannot come to Denver. <clears throat> as far as my own credentials are concerned, I am eight, going to be 89 years old in another two weeks. And that will be, by the time your symposium will take place, I will be past 89. And I am, uh, you asked me about before, about my origin and so forth. I've been born in Poland and my native tongue is Polish. And I arrived in the United States in 1947, starting a new life after the war. I am, as you can imagine, a survivor of a variety of terrible things that happened during the war. And uh, my American career, of course, is a homage to some extent to those who died during the war. You are still influencing the field. You're now finished with your fifth edition of Diagnostic Cytology and its Histologic Bases, which we have behind us if the camera can pick it up. We used to refer to it as the Bible, and now it's in two volumes, and it's grown so big that it almost cuts off the circulation in your legs. And Dr. Koss is pointing to the most recent version of Diagnostic Cytopathology and its Histologic Bases which has been translated into... The, the Chinese edition of the book just came out. And to my very great pleasure, the Chinese publishers did a very, very good job using first-class papers and good reproduction. Unfortunately, I cannot read the uh, text at this point in time, but... Uh, I'm told that it's uh, very adequate by some of my Chinese colleagues, and it took a lot of people to translate this text. As you know, it's really a huge text, and as I look back at it a few years later, I'm not sure how I managed to do all that, but that's neither here nor there. It's still, it's still I think it's still pretty accurate. Well, I've had the opportunity to read all five editions, and I recall you're telling me that you still wrote the fifth edition on yellow pads of paper rather than use a computer. Yes, to my, to, to my wife's despair, when I was writing the book, I was writing by hand in those days, and the room, my, my, my office was full of papers, and she was extremely unhappy about it. Every time an edition came out, I had to promise her that I would not do another one. But obviously, I didn't keep my word. A promise well broken. Okay. Let's go on and ask you the next of the questions that you and I have framed over the last few months. And that is, what attracted you to cytopathology? You were a practicing pathologist, I take it. Uh, where did you begin your pathology career, first of all? Actually... Uh, shortly after I arrived in the United States, um, after a rotating internship, I managed to secure a position downstate uh, in, a, in the hospital, which is called Kings County Hospital. And I became a member of the junior member of the faculty of the Long Island College of Medicine, which subsequently became the downstate medical school. And that's where I spent three years and, and writing some papers for the first time in the history of, the, of, of that the department for a very long time. I had a wonderful boss whose name was Gene Oliver, who was the pioneering American nephropathologist, kidney pathologist. 
And he encouraged me to, to do that. Subject of after these three years, I left for Memorial Hospital for Cancer and Allied Diseases, known today as Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute, to take care of a laboratory of cytology. I'm making a long story rather short, but I insisted that this should be that that this should be combined with services <coughs> cytology. My <coughs> chief then was the famous pathologist, that means smears, that Fred Stewart, <coughs> who became very helpful after a little while. He was not quite sure that he, in the beginning, that I knew what I was trying to do. But at that time, very, very few pathologists were interested in cells. Uh, I can name a few, a very few names, Dr. John McDonald and uh, Lou Wolner from the Mayo Clinic who are interested in lung cancer, Dr. James Reagan, who was interested in cervix cancer, but most of the cytopathology, especially the problem of pap smears at that time, was ignored by practicing pathologists for many, many years. I thought that this was a mistake. And because I was in some ways capable of combining the two, the two uh, uh, the two different fashions of morphologic expression. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought it was uh, rather important for me to combine the two, and that was the beginning of the first book on diagnostic cytology and histopathologic basis. At that time, uh, very, very few people were interested in it, but uh, the second edition did extraordinarily well. It was cited as one of the most cited texts ever in the history of American medicine. And, uh, and that was perhaps the beginning of the interest of pathologists in cells. Uh, that was followed by aspiration biopsy and so forth and so on. But today we have many young pathologists who take fellowships in cytopathology because it has opened new doors, new opportunities, diagnostic and research opportunities, which I think will be for the benefit of mankind. Tell us what got you interested in urinary tract, specifically in P. This was really a rather interesting story. When I returned from the Army service in Korea, uh, I received a phone call from a major chemical producer in the Midwest. And they have read a paper by a man named Jeffrey Crabb in the United Kingdom. He started looking at the urinary sediment of workers exposed to potent bladder carcinogens, which during the war were produced in open vats. So this company in the Midwest decided to do the same thing for the approximately 800 workers who were employed in producing this, this, this chemical. In this example, paraaminodiphenyl was the carcinogen, known carcinogen. And they asked us to look at the urinary sediment. And they, uh, I agreed. And we started a large study on these workers. And it became quite evident that we had some very serious problems with the interpretation of the material. And we got uh, quite often clearly positive, uh, positive smears showing clear-cut cancer cells in the absence of clinical disease. The urologists who took care of the workers were very upset that I would make a diagnosis of cancer in the absence of visible abnormality of the bladder, whereas the workers who develop visible papillary tumors had negative smears. And they could never quite really comprehend it. And I, I'm sure some of this misunderstanding persists until today. It became quite clear to me at that time, and that uh, there are two types, two forms, clinical forms of bladder tumors, 
uh, some which are composed of abnormal cancer cells and, can, and, are, and are sometimes not visible at all, and others that may have clear-cut physical and um, clear-cut urologic abnormalities in terms of papillary tumors, which did not shed recognizable cancer cells. That led to the concept of two, two uh, different types of bladder tumors, uh, the papillary and the non-papillary, and that is really a concept that until today is not clearly understood by many neurologists or for that matter pathologists. And uh, the, what has been observed and then confirmed by mapping studies of, bladder, of bladders was that the origin of invasive carcinoma of the bladder is for the most part from the f not visible flat lesions which we called carcinoma in situ of the bladder, <clears throat> whereas the papillary tumors had a totally different behavior pattern, some that recurred and some that didn't recur, depending on the makeup of the tumor and depending on the age of the patients. In the younger patient, the papillary tumors are really not malignant at all. 